Our next speaker uh, is Dr. Hans Kreider, who has served as the Division Chief of Orthopedic Trauma at Sunnybrook Hospital and at the University of Toronto. Uh, has a, a very vast experience with treatment of injuries around the pelvis and acetabulum, and is going to talk to us about the emergency treatment and, uh, and hemorrhage control for pelvic ring injuries. So Hans, thank you very much. Thank you, Steve, and uh, greetings to colleagues that I see have signed on from across the uh, ocean. Uh, good afternoon and good evening to those of you who are joining us from uh, across the way. So what I've been asked to do is to talk about the essentials of the initial management. And at the end of this uh, talk, I'm hoping that you'll be able to understand your role as a trauma surgeon and orthopedic trauma surgeon and managing a trauma patient as part of a team and to perform an emergency assessment of the pelvic ring and to control hemorrhage. We're not going to talk about definitive fixation. That's going to be later on and Chip will start that after this talk and to stabilize the pelvis provisionally. And this is all aimed at the early intervention that can hopefully save a life. So uh, looking at this patient who is a 47 year old crushed uh, in an industrial accident, you can see that pelvic trauma is often extremely high energy. And over the majority of patients who die as a result of blunt trauma had a pelvic ring injury. And the early deaths are due to hemorrhage. And the later deaths, of course, organ failure and sepsis. And what can we do to mitigate this is the substance of the talk that I'm giving right now. And uh, just to start things off, let's start with a little simpler case just to uh, organize our, our algorithms and our thoughts. So here's a 37 year old, she's uh, involved in a motorcycle crash and she's hypotensive. And uh, you know, what's our role in managing this patient? Well, our role is very simple. It's to look for pelvic bleeding and when we find it to deal with it. And so just have a look at that and in your own mind, think of what you think this patient is bleeding from uh, in terms of the pelvis and how you would mitigate that. And uh, we'll start how to look for bleeding. Well, some of you may have thought about looking for external bleeding, but many of you would have thought, well, I'm gonna put a sheet on and I'm gonna maybe put an emergency X fix on or whatever, but don't forget to look for bleeding externally. Bleeding externally has to be sought. Sometimes there's blood all over the place from various other injuries. Look for open wounds in the perineum, the rectum, the vagina, and don't forget to log roll the patient at some point and look for bleeding posteriorly. And although this wound right now looks fairly innocuous, it's just a matter of a clot letting go before it turns into this. So when you see an open wound, pack that wound to stop any bleeding that's ongoing or that may happen as a clot that's sort of tentative there might dissolve and let go. Of course, uh, internal bleeding is what we generally think about when we look at a pelvis that's open like this. This is an APC type of injury. And if it's an open pelvis, it really can't contain the blood. It, there's no tamponade effect because it just keeps expanding and you can hide a lot of bleeding in a pelvis that looks like this. So, uh, the formula for a sphere is four thirds pi r cubed and for a cylinder is r squared h. As the, as the radius of this uh, pelvis increases, you get uh, the square of the amount of blood that can be held in there. You've seen uh, a slide similar to this from Jason, uh, from Mark before. And you can imagine that if there's a fracture anywhere in that pelvic ring, and if that pelvic ring is moving around, it's going to bleed. And have another look at this patient of ours. Uh, and you can imagine how much disruption of those vasculature, uh, of that vasculature there is. And one of the things that happens when you've got a moving pelvis is it can't form a clot. Things are moving around, you can't form a clot and it's going to continue to bleed. And just remember that every single pelvis that has an injury is going to bleed to some extent. The majority are going to be venous, but 10% of cases where there's a major contribution from the pelvis to shock is going to be arterial. And these need to be uh, managed maybe a little bit differently. And we'll get back to this uh, as uh, uh, further on in this talk. 
So how do we identify a pelvis that's at risk of major venous bleeding or arterial bleeding? Well, it starts with a physical exam. You've seen some x-rays here, but the basis is the physical examination. So here's a patient, uh, and, and of course, what we're looking at here as part of the team is the C part of pelvic ring uh, of, of uh, trauma resuscitation uh, in terms of looking for the pelvis that's at risk for internal bleeding after somebody else hopefully has dealt with the airway and the breathing and put in the chest tube and so on. So here's a patient that looks like in Canada, at least we've got uh, frogs that uh, traverse the highways and when they get run over, they look like this. And this patient has a very abnormal position and that's either due to a pelvic ring injury that's opened up or the uh, proximal femurs or something else is fractured. But if you see an abnormal position like this, that's a pelvis at risk. If the pelvis moves when you examine it, then that's a, a pelvis that's at risk for bleeding because again, you're going to have disruption of those vascular structures. And if you've got hematomas in the flank or in the perineum, again, an indication that the soft tissues are torn and as part of a pelvic ring injury that this uh, uh, injury is bleeding. So a pelvic ring that's moving and a patient that's in shock, that's an emergency. And you don't have to do anything fancy. You can just tie the knees together and that's going to help. Uh, if the patient has a short leg or if on a gentle manipulation, you uh, feel that the, the uh, fracture is vertically unstable as well, well, you can apply traction as well. Now, I, I, we don't advocate doing an aggressive uh, examination to see if that pelvis moves vertically because again, you're going to disrupt blood uh, clots and potentially nerve roots as well. But these are the principles. If there's vertical movement, you might want to add traction. Most of you probably use some sort of commercial binder and uh, uh, the old folks like me prefer the sheets, uh, but they're not really so much available and the paramedics put these on the field. So we have to deal with them. But if you are one of those places that uses sheets, this is a, a slide from Chip Route. And you can see the nice reduction that you're able to get. And the beauty of this is that you can cut holes in for your arteriogram or your angiogram if needed. You can cut holes into this reduced uh, uh, pelvic sheet uh, and uh, put in iliosacral screws or whatever you need. And the general surgeons can usually cut into the top of it and do a laparotomy. But again, it's almost, at least in our center, historical because everybody comes in with a binder. So what's next? Uh, we've recognized the pelvis at risk, at least for venous bleeding. We'll talk about arterial in a minute. And we packed open wounds. We've immobilized the pelvis that moves with either a sheet or binder or traction or a combination. So what's next? Well, uh, continual reassessment is uh, key to managing a trauma patient. And the next stage probably involves doing some imaging. So far, all we've done is a physical exam and we can do this in minutes in the emergency department. So you've seen a, a talk from, uh, from Mark, an excellent talk about radiology, and we certainly won't go through that, but uh, these are the images that we usually wanna get when we're planning for the next stage. And uh, one of the things that I think is important to, to do, especially for the younger learners, is look at this pelvis and just uh, formulate in your mind what's going on. And then bear with me, look at the spinous processes and you know, sort of think about where the rotation of that pelvis has gone. And you need to explain why this area looks widened here when you know, this and this look widened here. So having that symmetry and trying to understand why uh, uh, things look the way they do in the front can often lead you to other injuries, as in a simple pubic ramus uh, fracture, a high pubic ramus fracture on the left side in this case. Here's a patient who has an AP pelvis and it looks pretty dramatic, but the way she comes in with the paramedics bringing her in the binder looks like this. So often you can see uh, if, you, if you have the luxury of seeing an injury film in an outside hospital, you can see more of the amount of displacement and the severity of the injury than you uh, may appreciate once the binder or the sheet is in place. 
you've seen these uh, inlet outlet views and uh, this is the inlet view and what to look for the outlet view uh, and the CT scan is really important if you're going to do any kind of surgical planning. And you look at this and you, you might want to know, well, if you're going to do a resuscitation screw, which we'll talk about in a minute, <clears throat> or an urgent fixation with a C-clamp at the back, well, is the other joint open? Or is the fracture such that you couldn't possibly safely put a C-clamp or a resuscitation screw without reducing that fracture? So these are important when you're doing the next steps uh, of treatment beyond a sheet and beyond traction. So what are some of those options? Well, here's a case uh, of Dave Stevens that uh, <clears throat> he put the C-clamp on while the patient was uh, having a laparotomy and uh, this stabilized the pelvis so that the general surgeons could deal with it. So this is one example, the C-clamp of urgent stabilization beyond a binder and traction. This is a picture of Chip Brout, a very nice uh, picture showing the cut in the sheets and putting a, a so-called resuscitation screw in that can be done with the sheet holding the pelvis and then getting a final reduction with the lag screw as you see there. So these are things that can be done urgently if you have the expertise and if you have the uh, uh, equipment available. Uh, but, you know, this patient could have been kept in the sheet uh, potentially as well. So here's uh, my patient and you can see there the reduction pushing the left side or pulling the left side down and pushing the right side up and putting an external fixator on through the anterior inferior iliac spines and applying traction on the left side. And uh, you can see the tension sutures there from the laparotomy that the patient had. So what are the corridors or what types of external fixation can we do? Well, uh, we like uh, the anterior inferior iliac spine corridor or the supraacetabular corridor. It's a little bit biomechanically better than the iliac wing and it controls the pelvis, uh, at least in the rotational uh, pelvic deformity in the plane of displacement. That is, if it's open, an APC type of injury, then it uh, is really in the plane of of pulling that together and closing it down. And uh, here are the fluoroscopic views, the obturator outlet view, and with a displaced pelvis, it's difficult because the iliac wing may be open. So again, if you've got a, a sheet or something that uh, holds the pelvis reduced, it's a little bit easier to get the, uh, the, the pin in the right place. This is the supraacetabular corridor, but there's nothing wrong with aiming the pin down into the sciatic buttress or into the area of the sciatic notch, as long as you don't go too far. So the uh, dangers here are if you go too lateral, the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, the sensory nerve, the hip joint, if you go too low, and it's easier to go too low than you might think. And if you're aiming at the greater sciatic notch, which is fine, uh, just make sure you don't over insert the pin and the iliac oblique view is, is helpful for, for that. If you uh, use the gluteus medius pillar pins, uh, you have to make sure you're in the bone and in the dense part of the bone. Uh, and it's easier than you think to go out the side. And of course, if you're pulling an APC type of pelvis together, that's not going to be very helpful. It's just simply going to break out. So if you are going to err on an APC injury and you're using the gluteus medius pillar pins, you might want to err on bringing it to the inner table so that it's not going to break out as you reduce that pelvis. Um, what else can we do? Uh, well, when, when, uh, sorry, when should we consider such emergency fixation or should we just leave the patient in the sheet and traction uh, initially? Well, for, for us, it's uh, often if the general surgeons are planning a laparotomy, they don't like the binder, they don't like the sheets. So we tend to put on a C-clamp or an external fixator or something like that. And we can do that fairly quickly while they're scrubbing to get ready to do the abdomen. It's better to do it before uh, in, in most cases because uh, that way the general surgeons have something stable to work with, uh, but it requires some communication with your general surgical trauma team. And if you're transporting the patient, if you're in a community setting and you're going to transport that patient, maybe it's uh, reasonable to put on a, a more 
uh, a frame or some more provisional fixation rather than just a sheet, but you can certainly transport a patient in a sheet to another institution if needed, and you just have to keep a bit of an eye on the skin. Well, what if you've done all that? You've done the laparotomy, you've put on the C-clamp, you've stabilized the pelvis, and the patient is still in shock, and the general surgeons tell you there's a lot of retroperitoneal bleeding, and uh, you know what, what's the next step? Well, if you've gone through this very simple algorithm, if the patient move, if the ring moves, if the pelvic ring moves, you immobilize it. You stop it from moving. Well, if you've done that, then it doesn't move anymore, and you might be in one of these situations where it's an arterial bleed. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the options to deal with arterial bleeds, but one of the most common historically has been an angiography and embolization of said arterial bleed. So here's a patient that uh, I took pictures of when I was a resident. So Mark Veris was the fellow and Marvin Tile was the staff on call. And this patient came in and had a massive uh, bleed, as you can see on this. This isn't a CT angiogram. This is just an old fashioned angiogram. And what was remarkable to me as a resident at the time was the butt hematoma, the buttock hematoma was expanding before our very eyes. And this was a branch of the superior gluteal artery. So if you see an expanding buttock hematoma, that's a sign of some fairly significant serious bleeding. This is the same patient, and you can see the bladder is displaced by that blood on the cystourethrogram. And again, that's a sign of fairly significant bleeding in the other side of the hemipelvis there. And we've talked uh, about uh, you know, the buttock and perineal hematoma, but this is a different patient, and Dave Stevens written about this uh, and others. Uh, if you see a blush on a CT angiogram, that's usually a sign of some fairly significant arterial bleeding. And of course, we're all, we're talking here, uh, the, the most significant hint that you might have an arterial bleed is if you've got a non-responder to immobilizing the pelvis with a sheet or traction or both. Well, one of the things, uh, if you're in the operating room, for example, already, and uh, general surgeons notice retroperitoneal bleeding, uh, one of the options is pelvic packing, and we used to do some of this uh, here at Sunnybrook and in Denver. This is a very popular thing, and it's somewhat institution dependent, but pelvic packing is putting those large lap sponges in and really trying to occlude the venous, but perhaps also any arterial bleeding that there might be, which means that you're really packing that area quite tightly, that retroperitoneal space. Um, another uh, option is Reboa, and that includes all of the arteries below where you've got the balloon inflated, except for the collateral flow, very effective way of uh, eliminating the, the bleeding, but uh, uh, again, uh, institution dependent. So final thoughts on the emergency management of the pelvic ring that's at risk. As, uh, it's a team responsibility to warm the patient and give them fluids. You saw earlier on that patient with the externally rotated uh, hips. Uh, you know, that patient needs to be covered. They need to be warmed and given warm fluids. And sometimes people forget in the uh, trauma resuscitation frenzy. Your job as an orthopedic trauma surgeon is to pack open wounds, bring the legs together, tie it with a sheet, apply traction if you think so, and that can be done immediately just after doing a physical examination. And then maybe after imaging, you can do external fixation, a resuscitation screw, or some other sort of fixation. And if there's arterial bleeding, if there are positive signs such as we've talked about, or if it's a non-responder, then you've got your options of angiography and embolization, maybe pelvic packing or reboa, again, depending on your institution. And the important thing is to keep reassessing that patient to make sure that they're improving and that you haven't uh, sort of missed anything. This is a patient that uh, was hit by a subway train and, and sometimes you, you will just fail. Uh, the paramedics are bringing in patients from the field now that are very, very extremely injured. And sometimes despite your best efforts, you will fail. But if you uh, adhere to the principles that we've just talked about, hopefully we'll save uh, some lives that are savable. Thank you very much for your attention.